I'm doing something a little bit different this morning that uh, I don't know if I've ever done. And uh, anyways, I was talking with um, Anthony the other morning. We're at prayer. We got to talking. Uh, T. Anthony, sorry. And um, yeah, we just got to talking about some recent miracles. And, uh, you know, I told him some stories about some things. It just kind of got started. And, and uh, I was recalling some different miracles. And, we're, and I'm, I'm just telling Anthony. And Anthony's like, <laughs> you know, it was just connecting with his heart. And he's like, just <laughs> praise God. And, and uh, you know, but, and actually, you know, we kind of got into it. We hardly, we hardly prayed. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but I was, I was like, uh, stirred in my spirit just by telling the stories and uh, as I'm as I'm you know walking out the door and and uh, I'm thinking I just want to I just want to find the devil I'm gonna kick butt you know and, <laughs> and uh, uh, you know I just I, I was so stirred and it it prompted uh, just this this particular sermon and um, it's like a, a refresh button was was hit you know, on a Mac, you you have the reset button. So there it is, right? And then I I don't know why you would have a PC, but they evidently have, you know, still have a PC. Okay, whatever. But uh, uh, <laughs> anyways, uh, there's uh, there's the reset set button, and so not reset, refresh, a refresh button, and so I want to talk about that just a little bit more, but David had discovered this button. And I want to read a text where you're going to see where he's feeling one way, and all of a sudden, he snaps and he begins to, again, like what happened with Tianthi and, my, and myself, and, and then all of a sudden, it's like he's stirred and and so let's go ahead and read the text now it's highly paraphrased I took out a lot of the stuff because I want to just zero in on certain phrases and sentences of this chapter of 20 verses really condensed it and uh, it's paraphrased but it's it's going to be uh, um, understood as we begin to read but follow along here with me on the um, on the screen Psalm 77 I sought And I cried out to God for help. And when I was in distress, too troubled, I was too troubled to even speak. And my spirit asked, will the Lord reject forever? Or show favor again? Will his love vanish? And uh, his promises fail? Will his love, excuse me, and, and will he be merciful or is he going to stay angry? So he's in this place where he's too troubled to even speak. Hard, hard place. Then I remembered, I thought about the former days, the years of long ago, and I thought, to this I will appeal. The years when the Most High stretched out his hand I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago and consider all your works and mighty deeds. You are, excuse me, you are the God who performs miracles. You display your power among the people. With your mighty arm, you redeem your people and he goes on to say the floods, um, the floods saw you uh, and withered and convulsed, uh, and the clouds thundered and poured down, and arrows flashed back and forth as lightning lit up the world, and as you trembled and quaked, and your path led through the sea, your way through the mighty waters, Though your footprints were not seen, you led your people like a flock 
So, here's David in the text where he's just so, like, discouraged, problems, trouble, to the point where he can't only talk, can't speak them. And yet, all of a sudden, he, he flashes back just the miracles that God had done in his life. And that's where we're going this morning. Um, a sermon I've entitled, Refresh Button. Amen. And so, um, think about what God has done. Think about what he's done. <clears throat> See, God's people often did this. When you read scripture, you'll see several times where they go back and Moses goes back and the prophets go back and the, and the apostles go back and Stephen goes back and they're talking about, you took us out of Egypt, you parted the Red Sea, you, you kept us through the floods, you kept us through the fires, you kept us through the wilderness and, and, and you made us a great nation and then uh, you broke us but then you rebuilt us and, and they're constantly going back and they're pulling up and pulling up uh, into their lives for a reason, Stephen, as he's preaching the sermon just before he got rocked, stoned to death, but he goes back over the history of what God did and the things God did and the people God, you know, worked through. And so, and, and so this is something that was just God's people often, as David did, remembered the miracles that God had done. So I got to thinking about the various arenas. I'm going to pull from my own life. Now, I was warned by my wife. <laughs> Too many stories. <laughs> Chop it down. Be careful. She knows me. But she's a nursery. <laughs> and so I, I'm going to, for the sake of driving home and to give you a sense of just what, what God had done in P. Anthony and myself, I remember the day of my salvation. A lying thief, a foul-mouthed pervert, bound. And more than that, I was deeply bothered within, deeply bothered and frustrated with who I was. And yet, the night I gave my life to Jesus, oh, the joy to sense God's love and acceptance when I was at my worst, the joy of that. I can't believe you love me, God. It was so amazing, and, and my whole life flipped and changed in every single way from that night, which was, today's what, like in two days, 1978 will be my anniversary of being saved. 78, yeah, 1978. Some of you might think 1878. <laughs> and then the evidence of God at work soon after that and the miracles. That one time I'm in church and, and uh, the preacher, guest preacher preaching, and so he's preaching probably about this many people, and he says, someone has a massive headache right now. And I had a massive headache. I was just trying to uh, really, really fight it and just pain in my head. And, and uh, so I had everybody just hold on to hands, and I'm like, what's going to happen? You know, and so everybody held hands, and he prayed, and I felt like a warm band go, ooh, right on my hand, just went, gone. That tripped me out. I wouldn't say probably three weeks or maybe a, maybe a month. Uh, and then, you know, Kathy had gotten pregnant. She was pregnant with our first child, Kimberly. And she's, she's nine months pregnant. No, first child, Shannon. <laughs> okay. You, you got it. I saw smiles. <laughs> first child, Shannon, and uh, she's nine months pregnant, and she's the baby's breech, Shannon's breech. No chance. So she has to have a C-section. And so, well, a man that was visiting uh, caught wind of that, and he called Kathy up, prayed for her, and... Um, I watched at the side. I'm watching Kathy, and here's Kathy's big belly. And, and uh, so he's praying for her. And, and as he's praying, he goes, whoa. Oh, he keeps praying. He goes, whoa, like that. And he's praying, whoa. And Kathy said, 
every time that that happened, she felt the baby go chick, 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 three times. That was on a Friday that she found out that the baby's breech, you're going to have to do cesarean, it's too late, it cannot change. Monday, she went to a different doctor because of the, the surgery now she has to have in the pregnancy, and the doctor checked her and said, this baby is not breached. Breach, yeah. Crazy. Crazy. What God did. Then Shannon was born, and oh, they're my first baby, and we're all into it, but something about Shannon's eyes. Every morning, she'd wake up, and they were just crusted shut to where she couldn't open up her eyes, and she had all kinds of crust. Well, her tear ducts were blocked. So now my new little girl, uh, baby girl, is um, having to go in for a real minor surgery, but still surgery that they had to put up, like something down her tear ducts to open the canal of her tear duct. And so she's all set up for that. And, and, I, mean, and I remember one night I just stood over her crib. I said, God, in Jesus' name, dead serious. And just, God, you got to do something. The next morning she woke up, no crust, none, completely, never came back, ever. I'm like, oh, God, you're so glorious. I remember the first time I heard a word of knowledge. What's a word of knowledge? Well, he we went to a church that was a potter's house, but not our potter's house, the one we went to, but we went with a, a, some friends, and uh, Jennifer and Bob Ghost. And so, you know, we're driving there, and she's all upset about her brother getting divorced and got a letter, and, and she's just talking about it. Talk. Well, we get to the church. There's probably 300 people there. And we're sitting down, and the preacher's preaching, and all of a sudden, he, he points to her. You. Stand up. Yeah, stand up. And he says these words. You just got a letter, and you're really distressed over that letter. But God has his handle on it. He has, his, he has control of this. And our, all of our mouths just dropped. Unbelievable. God, man, you are so active. And I remember everybody's getting words as pastors come through and preachers come through. And you know, people get words and words. I never got a word. I never got a word. And uh, you know, for eight years I'm saved. I never got a word. And, and so finally a guy pulls me out and he said, Rick, in essence, your heart's right. And I really needed to hear that. Because I'm thinking, am I fooling myself? <laughs> you know, I, I mean, I'm trying, but am I just, you know, am I really a mess or am I just trying not to be a mess? What am I? And Rick, your heart's right. I so needed to hear that. One week later, I'm in Prescott Conference, like 2,000 people. The man's preaching, he pulls me out. Stand up. He says, God wants you to know your heart's right. Exactly the same words. Incredible. Only God could do that. I went to a church service, and uh, I was just talking to the, you know, uh, Kathy, and Kathy, I got like these, these growth inside my chest, you know, your lip nodes and stuff, and kind of, Kind of making me nervous, you know, and all these lip nodes, and that's that's not a good thing, and and, and so, but they're really growing, they're hurting, and uh, so I so I went to this service, and the guy's preaching, and he and he walks out, and he walks up, and he says, "Stand up," he says, "You got a problem right here, right here, I don't know what it is, but we're going to pray," and immediately, bang, went away. Only God can do stuff like that. Oh, yeah. Just evidence of his work. He brings help in a time of need. I was telling Sean, you know, well, we're back in the Tempe church, and you've been saved probably three, four years, and, you know, I've got three vehicles, Kathy's car, my Cutlass, and my work van. They all broke down. Everyone, and I didn't have the money to repair it, so I borrowed my dad's van, and that broke down. He was on vacation. <laughs> and I, I'm like, God. So you know, I'm trying to use a cutlass. The other ones are too much money. And, and yet I had a mechanic come over, and he said, it's a rod. You have a problem? You, I think you've thrown a rod. 
And so he left. I called another mechanic. He came over and said, Rick, it's a rod. And so as, as we're listening to it, you know, all, the, all the ruckus of a rod, and all of a sudden it went, and it just froze up. It, it, it threw the rod and uh, seized up. I, I even put battery cables on it to, to try to get wooden butt. Just like, nothing. Just in. He said, it's gone. It's gone. So he left. I laid down next to that cutlass. I put my hand underneath. God. <laughs> in Jesus' name, God, you got to help me. I got out, got in the, behind that wheel. I said, God, you got to do a miracle. I'm putting the key in. So you got to do a miracle. Vroom! Started right up. Perfect. Unbelievable. That's incredible. At the time we have need, right now, God, you have to do something. He'll be there. He'll be there. <laughs> and he gets us through situations that you wonder, I don't know if I can make it through this. If he doesn't fix it, he's going to help you through it. He's always always there, and you've got stories, in, and he grants you just enough strength <coughs> to take the next step, and then just enough strength to take the next step, and, and on and on it goes. And then when there's demonic activity, you know, where it's like, this is the devil. I've seen it, guys. I've seen the first couple that came into the church in San Diego, very first couple as, we, as we're starting that church, <coughs> The wife was <clears throat> kind of a pill, and, and so they're having marriage issues. He'd come, but she wouldn't. And, and then finally, I went over to their house and said, what's the problem here? So I'm talking to him, but I begin to detect she had like a, like a spirit. She'd be laughing, and then she'd start crying, and she'd be laughing again. It's like, okay, let me pray for you. So I went up to pray for her, and as soon as I got my hand close to her, she was just said, just a tiny little girl, and and she hit my hand like blood, like lightning fast, <laughs> slapped it away. I went and put my hand on it again, like whack. She just slapped it away. So my God, no, 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 the top of her. <laughs> and, and she did get delivered. We're practicing one Tuesday night at the church. And, and I'm in a band, and we're trying to be a real band. And, but a guy that had been in out of church, a, an Indian guy that had walked in, and he's uh, drunk as a skunk. And he'd been there before, and drunk as a skunk. And, oh, he's been drinking vodka all day. And, and so, so finally I put the band on hold, and I went through a little hall that was right next to us, and just I prayed for him. As soon as I started praying for him, I said, you know, Troy, renounce the curses that come from your Indian heritage. And he did. He said, I renounce that. You know, this I had, I just led him through a quick prayer. And as soon as I started praying, he went, God, and just screamed, God, as loud as you can imagine. This is a big guy and just big in both ways. And, and, he, and, and he dropped. And like a fish out of water, he began to flop all over the ground. And I'm trying to put my hand on it. And, <laughs> Couldn't happen. Then I saw this. He was on his back, but his back lifted up, and his legs, his knees were bent, and he was on his feet, but he was like straight back, and he ran. <laughs> Bang! As he's like this. He's, he's vertical like this, but his legs like picked him and, then, and knocked him down that hall and this way and that way. And I'm like freaking out. <laughs> and that happened for probably... 10 seconds, beginning to end. And finally, he just dropped. And then, it's like he was just like unconscious. And then he opened his eyes. Boom. And he lifted his hand. Pastor, <laughs> I had a demon in me, didn't I? Yeah, I told you did. <laughs> and I'm telling you, I was walking. I'm like, I went home, man. I'm walking on a cloud. He was completely 
sober, came out, bought everybody drinks, came back. He was so excited. It was just too incredible. Another young man at the church, he had a wife. He thought everybody loved his wife. He's so jealous, overwhelmed with it. It's in his head. And finally, one day, it's like, this is way overboard. You're like, it's like he tossed a guy in his head outside in the parking lot. He was a little guy, and the guy he tossed on his head was a Samoan. And he comes in, he says, Pastor, that guy has a demon. And, he, and then he left. And so he's in the church. I had an evangelist with me. I said, let's pray for you. Come on, let's go to the hall here. And so me and the evangelist was there. And so he's looking at me, and so I'm talking to him. And all of a sudden, this demon just rose up. And he came at me like this. Look! And it stopped. Boom! Right there. It caught me by surprise. I did it by surprise. It's like, and as he came at me, and it stopped. Right here. And all of a sudden, it dawns on me. Huh, you can't touch me. <laughs> I began to laugh. He couldn't touch me. See demonic activity? No problem for our God. And when God has a plan, he has a will, nothing can get in the way of that. To stay in Turkey. Couldn't. Cost him fifty thousand dollars the last pastor ten years ago to get a permit to stay there in Turkey. It's a Muslim nation. Pastor up north, been there twenty years. Twenty years before he got his permit to stay there. He had to go in and out, in and out, in and out all the time. And so and yet we're there and we just were there that we've been there a week, but we went to get our permit within that first week. And Kathy and I are sitting there, we're talking. And all of a sudden, the guy out of nowhere comes, and it was kind of weird. He comes in, follow me. I can help you. We're like, and he just said again, follow me. I can help you. So I got up. I followed him. And bring your paperwork. So he took me up to one window. They stamped it. Took me to another window. Stamped it. Took another. Stamped. And so, <laughs> so we had our permit to stay residence for four years for 700 bucks in the first week. Unbelievable. That doesn't happen. He said, I don't even, maybe Kathy knows more of the story, but just came from nowhere. God did that. So, you know, well, there's no way. There's, there's just no way. Watch out for the way maker. He makes a way on Believable. Now, these are arenas. We're talking about demonic activity and help in the time of need and getting us through situations and sometimes just evidence that he's around. This is thinking back. I'm thinking back and, and uh, you know, what God's done. But then, you know, we have to cross the path of finances. And some of you have heard, but what in San Diego, we're pioneering. And we were, I'm working for myself, trying to start the church, four kids. We came to the point where we had no food, no money, and a little bit of gas, a little bit. And so, I, and so I woke up that morning. Well, the night before, we couldn't feed the kids, and so we were at someone's house. I kept feeding them more cookies. Eat another one. Eat another one. I'm serious. Because yeah. we didn't have any food at the house. The next morning, I, you know, we, you know I, I got up, and there was a smile on my face. I said, Kathy, today's the day. I had no work at the time. And, no money coming in. Like, Today's the day. God has to do something. So I'm a painter. I would go on houses and knock, see if people wanted to paint their house. And, and um, I didn't have Jay's smile or charisma. <laughs> and, yeah. But uh, so I'm going to, you know, and I had just enough gas to get to the area of town that I was trying to break into and uh, work for. And I didn't have enough gas to get home. But in my heart, I knew, say, like, God, you're going to do something. I was excited about it. I really was. I got there. I'm driving around in, in this neighborhood, and a tall house needed to be painted. So I pulled over and said, hey, uh, have you thought about getting a bid for your house? I, I, I'd sure like to help you with that. I can paint it. And, and you, 
Oh, look around. Oh, look around. First house. I knocked on his cell. Well, after I gave him a bid, he said, so when can you start? I pulled out my putting knife. I said, I'm ready right now. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so he said, okay. And so you know, I got up on the roof. I just began to scrape and, and uh, had this job. And so about 2 o'clock, I'm up on his roof, and he, he pokes his head out the window. He says, hey, do you need any money to buy paint or anything? And I told him, I said, um, well, you don't know me. I haven't been here very long, but uh, yeah, we, I could use some, some help. And so he said, all right. So, well, he, he didn't poke his head out until well, I think about 4.30. He said, hey, here. And he hands me up like this, a folded up check. And uh, <clears throat> so I got the check and I opened it, 500 bucks. I'm thinking, I got to get to the bank. <laughs> so I jumped down. <laughs> I raced to the bank. I got there in time. I cashed a check. And I went home, and I gave Kathy a couple hundred bucks. I, of course, I got gas. <laughs> God did that. Now, not just that, but I knew God was going to do something. But in painting that house, the guy across the street walked over to me. Hey, you're doing a great job. Could you paint my house? Sure. I painted that house, and he gave me a car, an automobile that we used for several years, a, a decent Impala. It was a 72 Impala, nice big car, boat of a car, and uh, gave it to me. And then I painted the house next door, and the house next door, and the house next door, because it was a, you know, in California, they, they, they had these, you know, homes are all kind of done, they're built at the same time. They have that here now. So, you know, <laughs> I never lacked for work from that moment on. In fact, Ben Green, a guy that was in the church and still in the church in San Diego, he got out of the Navy and said, Pastor, I want to start a painting business. Well, I wasn't painting anymore. So I want to start a painting business. I thought, Ben, follow me. So I went back to that first house that I painted. It had been six years. And so I said, hey, he's wanting to start a company and he's a painter. And he got that house to paint. And the house across the street. <laughs> and the next house. And the next, because it was just that time. And to this day, he's got a great painting company, painting business. That's God. God that does that. Staten Island, we're pioneering there. I'm working, and, you know, the one thing we could not afford was toys for the kids. You know, a little stupid one here and there, but, you know, the, one day, I, you know, I got home, and I was there, and, and I saw my kids running toward the house, and they're, all, they're carrying something. And so they're all excited, and they're coming, and, and they open the door, and they bring in this old, broken, bent-up bicycle. <laughs> Dad, we're going to fix it, and we're going to ride it, and I'm like, get that thing out of the house. It's, a, it's worthless. It's hopeless. And uh, so, you know, they're all like bummed. And, you know, and, but I remember walking away saying, God, I can't even get my kids bikes. I can't. you got to help me here. And so, you know, I went to preach somewhere. And you know, after I preached, the guy gave me $300 for a sermon. Now, that was a lot of money back in 1988, 300 bucks. And so I remember I got that check. I said, God, everyone can wait. I'm getting my kids bikes. I said that. I'm getting my kids bikes. Let everybody scream. That, that I owe. I'm getting my kids bikes. Well, I went to a church service to visit. And as I'm there, God dealt with me to give that $300 check. I said, God, this is my kids' bikes. But I signed the check. Kathy nodded her head. If it's God, dropped it in. The next day, I went out looking for work. It was tight. And it was so good. <laughs> it was one of those days where I got a job that took me about an hour and a half doing a garage door that was varnish. Now, you don't know this, but to, to varnish something is a whole lot easier than painting something if you know what you're doing. A whole lot easier, a whole lot faster. 
So you make good money on front doors. You make good money on like a wooden garage, you know. So, anyways, so I made I made three hundred bucks in like an hour and a half, and I went home and said, "Guys, that's what God did. Three hundred bucks. I got it. God gave it back to me." And you know what? For the next ten days, unbelievable. No. Next ten days after that, so it was actually eleven days, eleven days. Every day, for just that particular day, I made three hundred dollars. And God even like paid for my tithe, gave me that eleventh day, and uh, my kids got really nice bikes. <laughs> That's God. Finances, I'm telling you. That's God. When we're coming back from Turkey, I preached for a guy. He gave me $1,200 to preach a Sunday. Went to the next church. God dealt with me. Give the $1,200. I've learned. Sign the check over. Put it in. We were home two weeks. Long story short, as I was going back to Turkey in this furlough that we had, this I had $6,700 in my pocket. God blessed us again and again. You know, I felt God speak to me about a business and I was working on it. I still might do it. But uh, working on it, working on it, and I, I came to like a, a brick wall, you know, developing the product. So I went to a guy in Tempe while I was evangelizing, and Kathy was with me. I said, well, let me just see if I can get somebody to build this for us. So I went to a guy in the Tempe. He was an owner of a, of a factory, a plastics factory. And so he looked at me as I proposed the idea, and he said, I'm going to make those for you. I said, I don't have any money. He said, no, no, no. I'm going to make those for you. In fact, I'll make... $20,000 worth. You could use my warehouse. I have plenty of room to store them, and you launch your business from here. But I want to be the one to make this product. And so Kathy and I got up, and we walked out. We're like, what just happened? What just happened? And so, you know, this was like a wide open door. Well, I was on a Friday. Well, on Monday, we went to Prescott Conference. God spoke to me about Malta, going to Malta. So I shut the whole thing down. Never went back to them. I said, nope, I'm a preacher. I'm a pastor. I shut the whole thing down. I just shoved it aside. And um, you know what? We're going to Malta, and I was still evangelizing a couple more months before we actually took off. And, and I went through, um, you know, and I'm just trying to get completely out of debt, and things in order, before we go out to Malta, and because uh, the date's coming close, and so I preached in Perth, um, five services. The man gave me eight thousand dollars. The church. That's God. That's so God. I can go on, and on, and on. How God has blessed. When you simply believe and you trust him and you put him first, healings. <laughs> okay, either I'm lying or I'm not. But I prayed for a guy, two blind eyes. God healed him. Many of you have heard that story. God healed that man. <laughs> Unbelievable. Unbelievable story. A woman in a wheelchair that got up and walking. A grandma. She couldn't walk. She was walking funny, but afterwards she... She, she told me, it was, she was Filipino, and she couldn't communicate. She said, I could have ran and jumped. But she had a dress, and she had a diaper on, and she was afraid her diaper was going to come off <laughs> on the stage. She was, like, walking, but she was, like, walk, walk, walking real funny you know, <laughs> you know, to try to hold the diaper on. God. Another girl with a lump that they really feared was cancer on her breast. No, I didn't feel it. I just trusted what she said. <laughs> and... Uh, we prayed, and she comes back. She went and checked, came back, and said, it's completely gone. It's gone. A woman, Dewey Goo, in Turkey, as we're there, everybody's spooked by the church, the church, the church. There's a woman that lived up in the top 
of the building that we were at, the church, and it was all Muslims, right? Well, her brother had come in to a service, and then the next morning I saw him, and we ended up, I asked him, hey, you want to go for breakfast? He says, well, I was going to go see my sister. She's in the hospital. I said, well, you know what? I'll take you, and uh, maybe afterwards we can, we, we can get her breakfast. He says, okay. So we hopped in. We went. I had no idea how serious it was. No idea. As we're walking into his sister, she's 29 years old. As we're walking into her room, the doctor's walking out, and he stopped us. He said, call the family. She won't live through the day. Get in here. Everything was shutting down. She was dying. She was dying, like, like right now. And, uh, and, of course, he began to fall apart, and, and uh, uh, yeah, I didn't know she'd been in there for some time, and it just gotten worse and worse, but now she's at the end. This, she won't make it today. She, she will not survive today. And so I went in. She had this squeaky, soft little voice. And I told her about Jesus, and she said, yes, I want Jesus. She said that. She received Christ. I prayed for her. And lo and behold, the whole, her, all of her organs were shutting down. They're all shutting down. And, uh, but she, like, she, she came back. And all of a sudden, it's like back in a, like a surge. Uh, and she came back. She had lupus. And uh, anyways, uh, so she came back so fast. It was unbelievable. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, and she's out of the hospital in just a few weeks. And then they got her on this medication. She's like, Pastor, this, because she got saved. Pastor, the, you know, the medication is making me feel terrible. I went to the doctor. You know, and uh, and I'm with her, and and the doctor's beating the desk because I'm saying the, st the 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 medication's making her bad, and and he's like beating. Her. You don't understand. You don't understand. She was gonna die. She's gonna die, and and uh, we don't know what it was that uh, that brought her back, and you know, I, I didn't know what it was. It was Jesus in prayer. But what that did is by everybody in the neighborhood knew this little cute little girl, Huey Goo was her name. Everybody knew her and that she was dying. And yet now, she's walking around because of Jesus. And so all the people that said, I don't know about that potter's house, that church. I don't know about that. You know what happened? Everybody said, we better be careful not to touch them. Because God did that. And they knew it. God did that with Dewey Go. We better not touch them. And so it was, it was the hand of of God at work. Physical healings that God at the time that you need. Then they answer prayers. Serious prayers. Again, I'm talking with T. Anthony. I told him about my daughter Hope. Or, or, Stacy that had this little baby girl Hope trying to adopt. But the last minute after a couple years it takes they, they take her back. And she was devastated. Had this baby from the beginning. From this newborn. And yet, she had a sign in the back of her, in the back of her, uh, uh, you know, in the bedroom above the bed, and it said, "Hope leads to miracle." She, she uh, always wanted to name her daughter Miracle, if she had one. She couldn't have kids, and so, anyways, uh, you know, my daughter was devastated. And I remember coming down the stairs, and as I stepped down the last stairs, I just turned. Out, I, I remember the very spot. I said, "God, you." Have to bless Stacy. Give her a child. I remember just, just, just locking into God. It's simple. Just I was standing up. I said nothing more than that. The next day, they call her that, uh, hey, they got a baby for her. If she, if she wants, born in a parking lot. Both the parents were drug addicts. And, uh, uh, and so she, yeah, yeah. And so, uh, you know, so she began to, well, it worked out, she got that baby. It was on some, it was also a, had some drugs in it, and so they had to keep her in the hospital a while, but she got it home, and, and finally the nurses called, the weather nurses called her and says, hey, so uh, what's the name of the, of the girl? What's the name of the girl that, uh, uh, that, that, that you're calling her? Because we need to have the nurses here uh, use the same name that you're using at the house. And so, and the nurse just happened to mention, now here we call her Miracle. 
And so Stacy says, no, don't change the name. That's what we call her here. It's, uh, that's, that's what we've named her, Miracle. Don't change the name. So Stacy called us so excited. Hope led to miracle. That's, uh, that was on the back of the cradle, the headboard. Only God could do that. And she, she's with him in Brazil. Yeah. Miracle. Oh, sweetheart. Again and again. Is this too much? Too many stories? I've gone long. I asked God in going to New York City, God, you have to make it real. Make it real to me. So it moves from San Diego to New York City and start a new church. Just make it real. So I spun a globe. Boom. It was New York. With my eyes closed, I just tapped it. Stopped it. And I spun the globe again and think. New York. Wow. <laughs> it hit it twice. Yeah, and then uh, spun it a third time. Think. Turkey. Okay. Spun it another time and I ended up in the water somewhere. In the middle of the water. I think my finger covered Malta. Isn't that crazy? And when I got to a conference, and I'm thinking about this, and, and I walked up the conference, everybody's in line. Alfie Fisher was standing right in line. He was the last person in line, and Kathy and I are getting in line. He's the guy that took me to the church to get saved. So I, I'm walking up. He didn't know I was there. I'm just standing there. And I'm thinking, you know, all the way I'm asking, God, do you want me to go to New York? You've got to make it real. So there's all these little things. Uh, there's, there's so much, but I'll give you the highlight. Well, Alfie turns around, and he looks at me. I hadn't seen him for two and a half years. And he, and he says, hey, Rick, how you doing? So God's taking you to New York to start a church. Wow. That, that's what he said. <laughs> Blew my mind. So we go in, and I hear Pastor Mitchell preach. And at the end, I'm, I'm stirred about New York. And so I went to the front, and I'm praying. As everybody's praying at the front, and I told God, I said, God, I don't want to be infatuated. You've got to make this real. If you want me to go to New York, have Pastor Mitchell say right now that God's sending somebody into New York. I just said that. Praying over here, and Pastor Mitchell from the pulpit said, right now somebody's calling someone into New York. That quick. As soon as I said it, Pastor Mitchell said it. That's supernatural. Now, it, I can go on and on. And then even with the spankings that God gives us, it's always the hugs afterwards. It's like God blesses you. <laughs> it's like, no, they don't deserve this. But it's the God that we have. Amen. He blesses when we most don't deserve. So those are the miracles. I think back. What God does, what God's done. And I could go on and on, but I won't. I'll, I'll listen to Kathy here. But tell about it. Tell about the good things God's done. Talk about it. Have conversations and bring up the good things that God's done. Can you say amen to Anthony? Amen. String them together. That's purposely why I did this. Because when you string them together, one after one after one, it's like, God, you're too, you're too incredible. And you know what it does? When you bring these miracles to the forefront, it just inspires you. It encourages you. It gives you hope. And you can certainly tell that, God, you've been at work. God, you're still at work. And God, you're going to be before us in the future. So you're having some problems, like David. Hit the refresh button. It can restore performance. According to uh, Google, the refresh button, it restores performance. It removes unnecessary and deleted files. It safeguards against malware. It keeps files and settings right and updates the latest content. Hit 
the reset button. We'll close with this one last verse. Remember the miracles and wonders he has done. Remember them. Talk about them. Bring them back up. That's your reset button. Praise God. Let's pray. Glorious God.